Well, hey friends, uh, this Sunday we're going to be looking at the second lesson in this unit of six lessons entitled, It's All About Jesus. So this Sunday we're going to be looking at a lesson entitled, The Ministry of Jesus. The Ministry of Jesus. So last week we looked at the mission of Jesus, this week the ministry of Jesus. And as a reminder, all of these lessons are from the Gospel of Luke. And today we're going to be looking at Luke 6, 17 through 31, although we are going to skip over a couple of verses in there according to the, the prescribed text. Okay? So as a reminder, all of these lessons need to be placed in the context of the kingdom of God. We're going to see this over and over, how the kingdom of God helps us understand what's going on. So every text needs to be perceived and interpreted and understood in the context of God's kingdom. And we have been defining the kingdom of God as the lordship or the reign of Jesus through his people, the church, here and now and forever. So the kingdom of God is the lordship or the reign of Jesus through the church, here and now and forever. Okay, We've seen at last week that Jesus was in the process of establishing the kingdom and announcing the kingdom as his mission. And now we're going to see how he establishes the kingdom of God through his ministry in this text. Okay, so that's where we're going. A good question that you might want to consider asking your class at the beginning of the class, because we're going to come back to this at the end to answer this question. And how people answer this question at the beginning doesn't really matter. But it's a good question to get your class thinking. And here's the question. Is Christian love different from non-Christian love? And if so, how is it different? So we're going to come back and talk about that at the end. And we're going to kind of see some, some hints of, that, of answers to that question in the text. Okay? So if you ask that question, let people respond. Just let that be a good point of discussion to get the class going. Okay? Well, let's jump into the text. Luke chapter 6, first of all, verses 17 through 19. So I'm going to be reading from the leader guide. Luke 6, 17 through 19. After coming down with him, he stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and a great number of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those tormented by unclean spirits were made well. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. So this is a, a text where Luke records this story because he's helping us understand that Jesus actions reveal that he is bringing the kingdom. Now remember we said his mission was to announce and establish the kingdom of God. Okay. Well now we see how he is doing that through his ministry. In this text, these verses help us understand how he's doing that. So he's, he's teaching, they came to hear his teaching, but he healed them of their diseases. Those tormented by unclean spirits were made well. So demons were being cast out. And the whole crowd was trying to touch him. So people are reaching out because power is going out from him. So as Jesus is moving, as Jesus is ministering, as he is moving around the country and touching people and preaching and ministering, there is power. The power of God is flowing out of him to accomplish these things. And these things demonstrate that the kingdom of God has arrived. He wasn't simply going around doing good. Yes, he was doing good. Yes, he was healing people. Yes, he was touching a lot of people and making them well. But the point here is not that Jesus was just doing random acts of kindness. The point is that Jesus' ministry reveals the presence, the establishment, the coming, the arrival of God's kingdom. In essence, he's saying, the kingdom of God has come in me, and now I'm demonstrating that the kingdom of God is here. Now, if you remember, if we go back to last week, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was teaching at the synagogue in Nazareth. And he read from that passage in, in Isaiah where he says, when, when God returns, when God establishes his kingdom, all these things are going to be ha happening. And he listed these things, which are now echoed in these verses. So it's as though he was saying in Luke 4 at Nazareth, the kingdom of God has arrived. In fact, he said, this text has been fulfilled in your hearing today. I'm the one making this happen. And now, two chapters later, he's in essence 
demonstrating and proving through his ministry that in fact the kingdom of God has been established and is being established through his ministry. So, chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, one good point of application is that kingdom of, the kingdom work, whether it's then or now, kingdom work is doing whatever we can to make the kingdom real here and now. And we said this last week, but when we minister to people, when we feed people with no food, feed the hungry, when we clothe people that are poor and have no clothing, we are doing kingdom work when we do this in the name of Jesus. So Jesus has set the example for the kind of ministry we're supposed to be having. Okay, let's look at the next text. Chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. So then, looking up at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are hungry now, because you will be filled. Blessed, who are, blessed are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Take note, your reward is great in heaven. This is the way their ancestors used to treat the prophets. So, really significant text here and helps underscore a principle that we're going to see all through the Gospels. Really, it's a biblical principle, but we especially see it in the Gospels. And that is that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God works upside down from the world. The world operates one way, the kingdom of God, and how we are to act, the kingdom of God turns that upside down. So everything is different in the kingdom of God. It's just the opposite of how the world works. So, and we've seen this in other texts, you're probably thinking about other places, but it's certainly apparent here. So, blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of God and all the riches of the kingdom of God are going to be yours. If you're going to be hungry, if you're hungry, blessed are you if you're hungry, because you're going to be filled. Phil, you mean, it's turning things upside down. Blessed are you who weep, because you will laugh. So this, and it goes on and on, this principle that the kingdom of God turns things upside down. Now, it's really important to understand this is, does not provide for us a formulaic means of gaining or acquiring wealth and health. It's not as though he's saying, well, if you really want to be rich and have lots of money, first you've got to be poor first. So you give away everything, and then God's going to bless you with all kinds of physical wealth and monetary wealth. That is not what he's talking about. He's pointing to this principle that as kingdom people, God's people, we are to set aside our aspirations, our worldly aspirations, and pursue the kingdom aspirations, the things of the kingdom, seek first the kingdom of God, and then we discover in that context that we are made rich, maybe not in worldly goods, but we are made rich according to kingdom standards, and that's what he's going after. That's what he's pointing to, is that the, the kingdom of God turns things upside down, okay? So that's really what we're wanting to see here and understand. Now, let's go to the next text, verses 27 to 31. Because we're really getting to some of the, 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 the heart of what we need to understand today about the kingdom of God, about the ministry of Jesus, and how he, how he brought the kingdom of God in his ministry through sacrificial love, okay? And we're going to see that in these verses. So verses 27 to 31. But I say to you who listen, love your enemies, do what is good to those who hate you. Here it, again, here it is again, turning it upside down. The world thinks this is the opposite of this. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. And if anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you, and from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. Again, the kingdom of God is upside down. But what's important in these verses that we really need to grasp is that kingdom behavior is characterized and demonstrated by sacrificial love. Sacrificial love is the way we make the kingdom of God real in our current context. It's how Jesus made the, the kingdom of God real in that context. 
Ultimately, we see that on the cross as he goes to the cross. The cross is the ultimate act of sacrificial love. And it's how Jesus, through his death, through his sacrifice, conquered the power of sin. So we now have that capacity. We have now have the ability to exercise sacrificial love. And that's what these verses are talking about. Just look closely at them. You see it over and over. Do what is good to those who hate you. Sacrifice. Sacrificial love. Now let's go back to that question we asked at the beginning. Is Christian love different from non-Christian love? Well, in one sense, the answer is no, because even non-Christians can love. It would be silly for us to suggest that only Christians can truly love. History is, demonstrates over and over that lots of people, in fact, oftentimes, non-Christians are better at loving than Christians. So it's not that non-Christians can't love. Both Christians and non-Christians can love. But there is a difference. When Christians choose to exercise sacrificial love, somehow, mysteriously, God releases his power to bring about and to make real the kingdom of God in that context. It's not so different from when, when it says right back in verse, uh, verse 19, the whole crowd was trying to touch Jesus because power was coming out from him and healing them all. Jesus ministry of sacrificial love released the power of God. Now, you can't always see it. It's not always evident. It's not like every time you do an act of sacrificial love, the clouds are going to open and the, uh, you're going to hear angels singing. That's not the case. But when Christians exercise sacrificial love, God does something through them that he will not do through non-Christians. The power of God is mysteriously wonderfully, sometimes invisibly, released through our sacrificial love to make a difference in that context. So, I think these verses, when we study the ministry of Jesus in these verses, we understand that his ministry was characterized by sacrificial love, and now we are to live and minister through sacrificial love that turns the worldly standards upside, upside down, and as we do, then God's power is released through us to bring the kingdom of God and make the kingdom of God real in our context. Thanks for listening.